Well, good morning, class. Welcome back to uh, our time as we're studying the life of Christ. Today is October 12th, and uh, per the syllabus, we're going to be exploring this lecture titled, Follow Me. Follow Me. And, and really, we're going to be focusing in on Jesus's words in the Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter, verses 23 through 27. These are familiar words. They're, they're not restricted to the Gospel of Luke. We find them in Matthew and Mark and Luke's Gospel. And in a lot of ways, um, these words of Christ, these this command for people to um, take up their cross, turn from their sins, follow Jesus, in a lot of ways, this sort of encapsulates uh, a lot of the message of Jesus, which is interesting in some sense, because um, I, I want you to, if you haven't done it already, in fact, maybe I should say that, yeah, if you, if you haven't yet, pause the video, read Luke 9, 23 through 27. It's, it's small, it's short, it, it shouldn't take you more than 10, 12 seconds. Read it and read it and read it and read it. Read it five, six, seven times until you have it um, just sort of fresh in your mind. And, and after you read it, then I want you to, to come back and we'll look at this class together. So I'm assuming that you've read it now. I, I want to ask you a question, and, and that is, what is at the heart of evangelism today? And so to, to, to maybe prime the pump, I want you to step back for a moment and think of maybe a Sunday morning church service. You, you've no doubt been a part of these or or maybe even one of these sort of old-timey evangelistic rallies where they sort of bring in a big white tent or something like that. And I want to ask you whether this is a, a Sunday morning at the typical your typical evangelical church, maybe the church in where, where you are a member, or again, one of these old, sort of old-timey um, evangelistic crusades. I, I want you to tell me what is going to be emphasized the most? Right? What, what's going to be the drum that is continually beat on that Sunday morning at that Sunday morning church service or at that Saturday evening evangelistic rally? The pastor, the evangelist, what will he say routinely? What might even be the climax of this message? Well, he will say, God loves you. God loves you. That, that is certainly, at least in modern evangelicalism here in the 21st century in North America, that is at the heart of evangelism. Now, I want you, and, and I'm not necessarily saying there's anything inherently wrong with that. I'm just trying to set the stage here. Now, if we were in class together, which we're not, which I lament, but if we were, uh, this is at the point, it's at this point when I would hand out to each of you, so uh, Mariana, Robbie, Celine, I would hand you each a concordance. Now, I don't know if you know what a concordance is. They're usually big, thick books. The ones that I use nowadays are electronic, but I got some old dusty ones that uh, I hand out. And one of the reasons that I use electronic ones now is because concordances, again, they're, they're this thick. They're, I mean, they're massive massive books. Uh, and the reason they're so massive is because what a concordance does is it records for you pretty much every word that is ever used in the Bible. And what it does is it tells you every place where that word is used. Okay? So it's like a dictionary, except it doesn't give you a definition. It gives you a place where you'd find it in the Bible. So for example, I'm looking at Luke 9, 23. Um, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. And so let's say you wanted, let's say you're thinking, you know, I remember there's a Bible verse about Jesus saying we're supposed to deny ourselves. I can't remember where it is. Well, you would grab your concordance, you would find the D's, right? And then you would look up the word deny. And again, instead of it being a definition of the word deny, it would give you all the places in which that word is used in the Bible. And Luke 9.23 would be one of those. So I would hand each, all three of you a concordance, a big thick book that could stop a bullet. Uh, okay. And I would hand you a concordance. And this is what I would want to say to you. I would say something like this. If you wanted to see how the early church, 
And by that, I mean the apostles. If you wanted to see how the early church proclaimed the gospel, what book in the Bible would we want to focus our attention upon? So again, say a little bit differently, we, we know today at the heart of evangelistic preaching is um, an, um, uh, an emphasis upon the love of God. Well, let's say hypothetically we wanted to compare the preaching of today, evangelistically speaking, with the preaching of the, the evangelistic preaching of the apostles. Where would we go? What book of the Bible would be sort of the book that would give us the clearest picture? And again, I having no interaction with you. So I'm hoping that one of you, all of you were, are saying or muttering under your breath, well, the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the, the biblical record of the early church and its expansion from Ju Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. It's the book of Acts where we have actually, in a lot of ways, the only recorded sermons that the apostles preached to unbelievers, right? So if we want to see evangelistic preaching, we want to see evangelism, then we go to the book of Acts. Fair enough. And so here's what I would do. I would tell you, Robbie, grab your concordance, and Celine and Mariana, grab your concordance, and I want you to look up the word love, L-O-V-E, look up the word love, and I want each of you to begin jotting down on a little piece of paper all the instances in, where, in which you find either the noun or the verb of love in the book of Acts. So again, this is, at this point, what I would take my coffee break. I might uh, use the restroom, check email. I'd give you guys five, 10 minutes to scour your concordance and jot down all the usages of the word love, either in its noun or verbal forms that is found in the book of Acts. So here's, here's the rub on all of this. If you had a concordance in front of you, and if we were in class, there would all of a sudden be sort of this awkwardness and the awkwardness would be the result of this. There is not one single usage of the noun form of love or the verbal form of love in the book of Acts. Let me say that again. If you will concede that the book of Acts is the biblical record of the early preaching of the apostles, particularly as it rates, relates to unbelievers. What you recognize is there is not one time in which, at least recorded for us by Luke in the book of Acts, do we see the apostles ever, 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 not once saying anything about the love of God. Now, that should be jarring to you because we've already noted that the emphasis that we have today, again, whether it be in most evangelical churches on a Sunday morning or whether it be at our kind of white tent evangelistic rally, the emphasis today is on the love of God. So there's a chasm that exists. And my question this morning is something to this effect. Why is the modern church so infatuated with love? In other words, if you're staring at a concordance and you're looking and you realize that, that Peter and James and Paul, when they're preaching to the unbelievers, they don't have one instance of the word love. Why is it that most evangelistic sermons and outreaches can't get three minutes without talking about the love of God? Now, I want to be jarring. I want to be provocative. But let me be quick to say this. I am in no mean, in no way suggesting that we ought to jettison love from the Christian religion or even from evangelism. I'm not suggesting, I'm not saying that because you don't find that word in the book of Acts, you can't say to unbelievers when you're evangelizing them anything about the love of God. I'm not saying that, okay? What I am suggesting is that perhaps we have grown unbalanced. Love seems to be all that we talk about when in fact in the New Testament, it is repentance which seems to be emphasized. 
So the New Testament does not emphasize love, but repentance. In today's world, we do not emphasize repentance, but we do emphasize love. And to sort of put a pin on this, again, return to Luke's gospel, and I, I want you to notice this is sort of Jesus' evangelism. When, when Jesus is, he has his big white tent evangelistic rally, this is what he says, Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, right? He's not talking to his 12 disciples here. He's not talking to his inner crew. He's talking to the masses. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Though the word repentance is not used there by our Lord Jesus, that's certainly what is intimated, right? Take up your cross, follow me, right? This is all sort of intimating repentance, which I suppose now is a good time to define repentance. This is one of those kind of Christianese words that gets, used, that gets thrown around a lot. What does the New Testament actually mean by Repentance. So let me give you a definition. This comes from a Greek lexicon. This is Launida, Launida. Uh, this is how they define repentance. Repentance is to change one's way of life as the result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. Uh, this same source, Launida, goes on to say this. Though in English, a focal component of repent is the sorrow or contrition that a person experiences because, to, because of sin, the emphasis seems to be more specifically on the total change, both in thought and behavior with respect to how one should think and act. Now, I recognize that's a mouthful. Let me allow John Piper to sort of summarize that for you. What does repentance mean? John Piper summarizes the word in the New Testament means a change of heart and mind. It's a change of heart and mind. It's a change in the way that we think and the way that we feel, okay? J.I. Packer, the late reformed theologian, he summarizes repentance this way. Repentance is more than just sorrow for the past though it's not less than that. Repentance is a change of mind and heart, a new life of denying self and serving the Savior as king in self's place. Let me, at this point, share a video with you from YouTube. I hope this was going to work okay with volume. We'll see what happens. Uh, this comes from Paul Washer. This is a little four-minute clip and he is going to give a definition of repentance and then give an illustration, which um, I, I think is, is more than helpful. So let's watch this um, video. What is repentance? It means change the mind. Well, that sounds superficial. Well, if you use your mind, it won't sound superficial. You're all sitting here very calmly right now. Your pulse is not racing. Why? Because you don't believe this auditorium's on fire, and it's not. But if you thought, if your mind changed, if your mind changed, and you thought this auditorium was on fire, what would happen? Everything. Absolutely everything about you would change. Would your emotions change? Absolutely your emotions would change. Would your will change? Your will would change. Would your actual actions change? Yes, they would change. You would no longer sit there calmly. You would jump up and run through the door, run over people, jump out a window, but you would get out of here. 
You see, the mind is the very control center of everything you are, your will, your emotions, your actions. For the mind to truly change about something makes everything change. Let me give you an example. The greatest example of repentance I know in the Bible, the apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, he left Jerusalem for Damascus. In his mind, he believed that Jesus Christ was the greatest false prophet that ever walked the planet. In his mind, he believed that the Christians were enemies of the people of God and enemies of God and should either be imprisoned or killed. That's what he thought with his mind, and that's the way he acted. He went to hunt them down. He stood there at the stoning of Stephen and agreed with it. Because he thought in his mind that Jesus was a false prophet and that Christians were the enemies of God. On the road to Damascus, what happened to Paul? His mind changed. It was cataclysmic, wasn't it? I mean, it was unbelievable. Standing before him is the resurrected Jesus Christ, the one he had been persecuting, blaspheming, hating him. He realizes, Paul the apostle realizes that he is wrong about everything. The very fabric of reality tore apart that moment for the Apostle Paul. He was wrong about everything. Do you see that? In his mind, everything he thought was important, he was wrong. He thought Jesus was a false prophet, the greatest false prophet, only to find out he's the Messiah and the son of the living God. He thought Christians should die or at best be imprisoned. And he finds out that he has become the greatest persecutor of the people of God. He was wrong, totally and completely wrong. What happened? He goes to Damascus, believing in Jesus Christ, proclaiming Jesus Christ and giving his life to the people of God. He repented. It wasn't a work. It was a change of his heart, change of his mind. Just like faith has works or it is dead, so repentance has works. John was very careful about that. Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. It doesn't mean that you repent and work. It means that if you have truly repented, your emotions, your actions, your will, everything will change. Just like that uh, that video is is good and helpful again just returning to the illustration that that Paul Washer used there with the mind and then actions right if if you believe that the room that you were sitting on sitting in was on fire uh, you believe that in your mind, then everything about you would change. And so the way that I define repentance um, is I say that repentance calls for a change in affections, attitudes, and actions. Affections, attitudes, and actions. And this, guys, is the dominant theme and motif that you find in the New Testament. And, and honestly, not just in the New Testament, in, in the whole of Scripture. Let me just give you a, a very brief, just confining ourselves to the New Testament, I mean, very super brief sort of overview of this. John the Baptist, who is um, sort of the, the last of the Old Testament prophets, he, he's the forerunner for the Messiah. You remember the words that he said? He said, this is Matthew 3, 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. What did he come preaching? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist's first words are repent, turn, change your attitude, change your affections, change your attitudes, change your actions. It's no surprise that if those are the first words of John the Baptist, that when you come to the Lord Jesus himself, of whom John was a forerunner, what are the first words out of Jesus's mouth? And we've looked at them at length in Mark 1. 
He says, verse 14, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, here's Jesus' first recorded words in Mark's gospel, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So, so John the Baptist's first words, repent. Jesus' first words, repent. If you go to the book of Acts, and you look at Acts chapter 2 and the so-called first Christian sermon. How does Peter end his sermon? He says, beginning in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the, bro uh, of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? They, they want to know, Peter, in light of what you've been telling us, what are we supposed to do? Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter, how do we respond to all that we're hearing? Well, the same way that John told you to respond, the same way that Jesus told you to respond, so now Peter says, I tell you to respond. Repent. You fast forward to chapter 3, and you look at verse 19. You look at verse 19. This is Peter's first sort of evangelistic sermon to the Jews after uh, he finds himself sort of in trouble. His sort of first sermon to the Jews in trouble. Acts 3.19, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Or fast forward to Acts chapter 17. And if you look at verse 20, that's not right. Um, do, 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 do. Acts chapter 17, verse 30, rather. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. This is Paul now preaching his evangelistic sermon there uh, at Mars Hill or at the Oropagus, same place, just different name. He concludes in Acts 17, 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. In fact, if you were to ask, how, how, do we, how are we to summarize Paul's message that he preached? How, how do we summarize Paul's gospel that he proclaimed? Well, there's, there's two ways to do that, and Paul tells us in his own words in both accounts. Acts 20, verse 21. Excuse me, Acts 20, verse 21. I'll start in verse 20 for context. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. These are Paul's words to the Ephesians elders. He's sort of giving him his resume. He says, I did, not I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. What, what was Paul teaching? What did he not shrink back from? What was he declaring from house to house? Acts 20, 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how Paul summarizes his ministry to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Repentance toward God and faith in Jesus. Or you see the same thing in Acts chapter 26. This time Paul is standing on trial before King Agrippa. And he summarizes in Acts chapter 26, verse 19, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. But guys, what, what I'm wanting you to see is that there seems to be an imbalance in modern evangelicalism versus apostolic Christianity. The emphasis today is upon love. The emphasis in the New Testament is upon repentance. So here, here's how we're going to sort of end this, summarize this, kind of wrap this all up. When you look at Jesus's evangelism, the accent is upon repentance. The accent is upon calling those in front of you to recognize that they stand under the wrath of a holy God and that they must turn from their sin. They must turn from their affections and their attitudes and their actions. They must turn from their way of sin and self, and they must turn toward Jesus, who is the Savior. Let me put it this way. We will not understand Jesus 
We will not understand the apostles. We will not understand the Bible till we understand that the gospel begins with us being summoned to repent. That is Jesus' message to those around him. He's saying, follow me. He's saying, you're going one way. Turn, repent, change your mind, change your actions, change your directions, and follow me, Jesus would say. Because in following me is where you find life. It's my hope and my prayer that each and every one of you have repented and are repenting and will continue to repent that you might avail yourself of the grace of God. Until next time, Lord bless you.